it is possible that you were a bit troubled by or confused about the reading, chapter 18, the section we'll be studying this evening. Because in chapter 18, we read about the burning of Babylon. And perhaps if you've been tracking with us and thinking this thing through, that might cause some questioning in your thinking. Because in chapter 17, in our study last time, we saw Babylon being devoured, wiped out, done away with. So if that be so, then how come in chapter 18 Babylon appears again and is once again taken down? What's the deal? And chapter 17, chapter 18 have caused confusion in the minds of some who have studied through the book of Revelation because you see Babylon destroyed in chapter 17, but then it appears again in chapter 18. So what's going on? Well, here's the deal. Chapter 17 deals with mystery Babylon, the mother of all harlots. And the language of chapter 17 is figurative. It speaks about Babylon as a system. And that system is the false one world religion that will form after the true Christians are raptured and taken up to heaven. There'll be a one world religious system. And that Babylon, this system talked about in chapter 17, is based in the city of seven hills, which all throughout history has been known as Rome. No question about that. So chapter 17 is talking about a religious system. And initially, this coming dictator that is going to dominate the world in those last years of world history as we know it, that is during the seven-year period of time called the Tribulation, this dictator who is a political figure who gains power by controlling the revived Roman Empire, that is, ten nations talked about in Daniel's prophecies and throughout our study in Revelation, ten nations from the old Roman Empire re-emerging, coming together in a United States of Europe, if you would. And those ten nations that come together are going to be controlled by Antichrist, this dictator. Now, Antichrist, when he comes into power, is initially going to come into a confederation with this religious system. They're going to be allied together initially. And the religious system, those that are in Rome, in charge of this one world religion, are going to think that, hey, we are really in control, but we saw in chapter 17 in our study last time that Antichrist will just use this religious system for a season, and then he turns against it, he destroys it, he denudes it, he devours it. John, do you really think that the European community or this revived Roman Empire or this United States of Europe is really going to be unified with a religious system based in Rome? Do you really think that's conceivable in today's geopolitical environment? Well, I do, as a matter of fact. Because in our little Medford Mail Tribune yesterday, this, of course, was in the international section of the Medford Mail Tribune. From Genizo, Poland, 
listen to what the article says in yesterday's paper. In an extraordinary gathering, Pope John Paul II brought seven European presidents together Tuesday, telling them that a united continent of Europe can neither ignore its Christian roots nor can it be a club exclusively for the rich. The seven presidents came from Poland, Germany, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Lithuania, and Ukraine. While only Germany is a member of the European Union and NATO, most of the others are awaiting admittance. The Pope has attempted since the collapse of communism to rekindle Christianity in Europe and to keep its young democracies tied to its Christian roots. And I read this and I thought, even the world is saying it's an extraordinary meeting when the Pope gathers seven European presidents together and lectures them. It's an unusual, what the paper, what the AP calls an extraordinary gathering when the Pope lectures these European leaders that they must not ignore their, quote, Christian roots. And so we see, even yesterday, how the religious leaders that are presently in Rome are already speaking directly to the European leaders that are coming together and, and really exerting some influence. Well, it's going to happen. Once the rapture takes place and all true Christians are removed, there's going to be a very definite seeming united front between the leaders of Europe and the Roman religious leaders based in Rome. But we saw Antichrist will, once he uses the religious system and no longer has a need for it, that's why it's called a whore, a harlot, this religious system. He will, after he uses it and abuses it, he will trash it and toss it aside and devour it. That's what we saw in chapter 17. Now, for you who are taking notes, we're jotting these things down. Chapter 17 deals with a religious system. But chapter 18 deals with an economic city. Chapter 17 is, in its language, very figurative. Chapter 18 is very literal. It deals with a city that is given the name Babylon. And what is going to happen to the city is literal and frightening, and it's heavy duty. So chapter 17, again, deals with a religious system. Chapter 18 deals with a commercial city. Chapter 17, we see, is hated by the kings. Verse 16 of chapter 17, for you who are jotting these things down, in verse 16, it says, the ten kings hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So the ten kings hate this whore, the system, the religious system. They're first in bed with her, but they really have a deep hatred of her and they will turn against her and destroy her. But in chapter 18, we talk about the commercial city. Verse 9 of chapter 18 says, The kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, that is, the city Babylon, shall bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning. So the kings love the commercial city. They hate the religious system of 17, but they love the commercial city of 18. In chapter 17, the system is destroyed by the kings. We read that again in verse 16. But in chapter 18, the city is destroyed by God, as we shall see. The reason I'm pointing these things out is because you got to realize there are two different Babylons. 
The first Babylon, chapter 17, hated by the kings, destroyed by the kings. The second Babylon, a different thing altogether, chapter 18, is loved by the kings and it's destroyed by God, you see. If you don't make the distinction, and a lot of people that study the Bible fail to make this distinction, it causes all sorts of confusions and problems, but you got to see there are two different Babylons. One, the religious system, figuratively speaking, called Babylon the whore, the harlot. Uh, chapter 18, though, hmm, is not a figurative Babylon. It's a literal city that is going to be destroyed. Now, here, the plot thickens. Okay, John, so you're saying that chapter 18 says that it's a literal city, a commercial city, the economic capital of the world. Are we really talking the city of Babylon? Babylon, that city there, 50 miles south of Baghdad in Iraq today. There are Bible teachers, good men, that say Babylon, the literal city of Babylon, the literal city in Iraq is to become, in the tribulation period, the economic capital of the world, and that is the city that will be destroyed. For it, they point out some interesting verses, and I'll read them to you. In Isaiah chapter 13, in describing the destruction of Babylon, verse 19, it says, And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. It shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation, neither shall the Arabian pitch the tent there, neither shall shepherds make their folds there, but wild beasts of the deserts, they shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures." And owls shall dwell there, and satyrs or demons shall dance there. And wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, dragons in their pleasant palaces. Her time is near to come, her day shall not be prolonged. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 19 through 22. God says, I'm going to deal with Babylon in a way that it will be like Sodom and Gomorrah. Nothing will be left. You who go to Israel, if anybody says, hey, John, let's go check out Sodom and Gomorrah, guess what? Impossible. We don't know where it was. It's been wiped off the face of the map. You can't go visit the ruins of Sodom. You can't take a tour to Gomorrah. Most people believe it's underneath the Dead Sea, which would make it real hard to tour. But be that as it may... <laughs> The fact of the matter is no one knows for sure where Sodom and Gomorrah was because it's wiped off the face of the map. God says this is what is going to happen to Babylon. It shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, verse 19. Now, that has not yet happened. We know exactly where Babylon was. Indeed, although Babylon, once the center of the world's economy, the center or seat of political power under Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon was overthrown by the Medes and Persians and began to go downhill from there until it's been just sort of a podunk, forgotten kind of place, but not wiped off the face of the map. Therefore, there are Bible teachers that would say, Babylon has not yet be, been destroyed in the way that verse 19 through 22 of Isaiah 13 describes. So Babylon must be rebuilt. And guess what? It is being rebuilt. Interesting. From the New York Times, October 11th, 1990, quote, under President Saddam Hussein, 
one of the ancient world's most legendary cities has risen again. More than a simple archaeological venture, the new Babylon is self-consciously dedicated to the idea that Nebuchadnezzar has a successor in Mr. Hussein, whose military prowess and vision will restore the Iraqis to the glory their ancestors knew when all of what is now Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Kuwait, and Israel was under Babylonian control. Around 18 years ago, Saddam Hussein did something that's incredible. He brought in a crack team of Japanese archaeologists to recover the ancient ruins of Babylon and then bring in thousands of workers, particularly from the Far East, they began to rebuild and restore Babylon. And if you go to Iraq today, if you're looking for a vacation spot, maybe you want to go to Iraq. If you go to Iraq today, you can go to Babylon. What will you see? You'll see the mighty walls having been built around the ancient city of Babylon, restored with great care under archaeological expertise. Walls that are mammoth, walls that in Nebuchadnezzar's days were so wide they could race six chariots on top of the walls of Babylon. The walls have been rebuilt. The palace of Nebuchadnezzar is complete. By the way, right down the street from the palace of Nebuchadnezzar, Saddam Hussein built his own little palace. The temple is complete. The theater is complete. The lake that was once there in the city has been restored and is now functioning, if you would. If you go to Iraq, you can go to Babylon today. It has been restored, and it is in the process of being restored at a price of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars that Saddam Hussein has invested in for what reason? Saddam Hussein fashions himself to be, as the New York Times said, the new Nebuchadnezzar, the last one who was able to conquer Israel. Why did Hussein go into Kuwait? The New York Times had it right. Saddam Hussein considers Kuwait, considers Israel, considers Jordan, considers Syria, considers all of that to be rightfully owned by Babylon or Iraq. The Iraqi people, keep in mind, are not Arabs. They're Persians. They speak a different language. Oh, we put them in the Arab category, don't we? But there is a great deal of racial tension between the Iraqis who are Persians, who speak Farsi, and Arab-speaking peoples. Although they will often travel in the same circles, that will give you some understanding about why the Iranians and Iraqis have fought so brutally, so bloodily for so many years. It's a different people group, really. And Saddam Hussein fashioned some coins, oh, about six years ago, in which his silhouette is placed in front in the coin, and on the back behind him is the silhouette of Nebuchadnezzar, and he calls himself the successor to Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem. Nebuchadnezzar controlled Israel. Saddam Hussein sees himself in the same role. Babylon has been rebuilt. Now you can go to the library and check out a newer book on Iraq and you can see pictures of the restored, rebuilt Babylon. Or you can go to a travel bookstore and pick up travel books and look at pictures of the restored, rebuilt Babylon. It is not yet complete. By the way, for you that followed the Gulf War, and I guess we all did, didn't we? When the Gulf War took place, there was a specific order from General Colin Powell that no matter what, Babylon, this rebuilt, restored city, which is in process of being rebuilt, was not to be touched 